agricultural career at the age of 18, picking apples in Washington State and later picked five subsequent seasons. In 1983, he earned a one-year degree in agriculture from Sterling College and homesteaded in West Virginia, where he has been commercially growing chemical-free pears for 28 years. From Barkslips Fruit School, he founded the Buncombe Fruit Nut Club, whose primary objective is to advocate and rally support for community orchards and public parks. He implemented two edible parks, one at West Asheville Park and the other in North Asheville at the Flint Magnolia Park, and has helped maintain all the edible parks in Asheville for the last 12 years. After attending a Northern Nut Growers Association national meeting, he became a nut passionado, and from all these confluences, the Nutty Buddy Collective was formed. He leads Barkslips Fruit School, teaching the public how to care for fruit and nut trees. He also offers his services to the private sector as a consultant and lecturer. Using his 20 years of agriculture experience and permaculture training mm -hmm. to help people live more abundantly and harmoniously with their environment. A few housekeeping tips before I turn things over to Bill. The Q&A and chat functions are enabled, so please post your questions or comments for Bill in there during the presentation, and we will get to those at the end. Without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to our guest speaker, Bill Whipple. Thanks, Lindsay, and good evening, everybody. Uh, this is my first podcast, so please bear with me. Um, I am a lot more comfortable talking to people in person. But they asked me to do a talk on um, uh, the economics of black walnuts or making money on black walnuts. And um, I think the objective is, is to get people to actually end up planting black walnuts. So if we can incentivize uh, and give value to black walnuts, then it becomes the possibility for viable crops that will uh, end up being planted and supplement farm incomes. <clears throat> black walnuts are really great. Um, they're, uh, such there's only one species of black walnut on the east coast so they're easy to find they're big they're really the gateway nut is there a picture the number one picture we could pull up on the screen see how that goes i've got a a, a, a little demonstration of uh when i do talks for kids and market and stuff like that this is uh, an array of all the nuts that some of the or a good bit of the good edible nuts that can grow on the east coast everything from the the oaks to the hickories chestnuts and then the walnuts i believe they're on the far right and uh, uh the other the other trees have lots of different um species uh in in their family Acorns especially are kind of complicated, but the walnut's really simple. I mean, there's the butternut up north, but the walnut, there's only one. So it makes it really easy to get started with. Once, if you're, if you're going into nuts fine, uh, as a financial endeavor and you're having people bring you nuts, it gets real, people need to have a higher level of, of knowledge of nuts in order to keep the nuts from getting mixed up because all the different nuts, nuts have different purposes, but there's just one walnut. So it's really great that way. I, uh, as an overview, can you all give me the, the menu of pictures, please? As an overview, um, I have something that I call the Icornucopia project. And uh, that's it right there. And there's a little sketch of sort of a vision I have of over, overview vision of a uh, nut economy. And the cornucopia has, uh, covers a lot of ground. There really doesn't anything physical exist. It's kind of more of a concept. But the dream is to uh, have several, several branches from uh, helping develop branding and the cooperative storage, you know, where, where nutteries uh, share equipment packaging even, um, and even sharing crops. So, uh, you know, one nuttery might have a big mast year 
uh, in in one state and another state doesn't have anything, and there's more than a, more than a one place can handle, and they end up sharing with another nuttery uh, in another state with the, the the trust and relationship that um, when they don't have any nuts, the other state will share back because mass can be irregular, mass crops can be irregular. But with walnuts, it's another great thing about walnuts is walnuts are pretty steady. You know, hickories, you might get a crop every five years, acorns every three years to five years, really inconsistent, tough to build a business plan around that. But walnuts pretty reliably have heavy year and a light year, uh, the trees do. And uh, that's about as good as you're gonna get for uh, tree crops, uh, native tree crops. Um, the Acornucopia also is excited about education, you know, doing classes and tours and speaking, you know, at conferences, uh, dream of something called Circus Quercus that goes around and helps uh, uh, communities get their nutteries started by having entertainment and, and sort of rebuilding a nut culture, you know, an authentic culture. Culture should be based on things that are coming from the land, which we don't do anymore. Um, and walnuts are a great way. I, I would love to, to, to go on tour with like uh, mobile processing units and you know trailers, you know, processing equipment on a trailer, and go to a community and, and help them and introduce them. You know, people would bring nuts in the community, and we would process them and and make food and have talks and and share stories and build connections. And out of that a community might decide that, yeah, they want to be an aggregate, maybe start off as an aggregate, uh, collecting nuts that would go to a processing facility that may be a little bit more developed. <clears throat> and that is the esta establishment of autonomous nutteries. Uh, I don't, I don't, as it exists now, there's one big um, nut processing facility called Hammonds. They're in, in Missouri and they buy nuts all over the East Coast. Uh, I think they do like something like 23 million pounds last year. So a lot. And that's the only player that's in, uh, that's really doing black walnuts. And the reason being is that scale has been essential uh, for their success. They're a huge operation, obviously shipping, you know, tractor trailer loads of black walnuts. They have aggregation stations all over the country. And that is one way to get started is to, if you're in a location where they have a, a aggregation station, a dehuller basically, um, you can bring nuts to them and, and familiarize yourself with that process. And then the next step would actually become an aggregator yourself and dehull and then sell to them. I would like to see small business take off and, um, people in their communities, keeping those nuts in their community, adding value to those nuts and sequestering those financial benefits that come from not just sending off your raw resources, but um, keeping them in the community as much as possible and building as much value and then selling them. And with um, the advent of some of the technologies that we have with robotics and AI, I think there's a lot of potential for small scale elegance uh, for small operations to be efficient and to maybe even surpass the efficiency of the cumbersomeness of having to ship nuts all across the country. Um, we, we bear the cost of small scale, which is labor intensive with black walnuts. Anybody who's out there who's fooled with black walnuts knows it's a very labor intensive uh, process, but can be automated. <clears throat> and the last part of the cornucopia project is um, doing orchard trials. And, and this is done with the, the Nutty Buddy Collective. And at my farm, we're planting out uh, walnuts and trialing different varieties, cultivars. And um, like I'm hoping that we have some time uh, later in the talk to talk about actually planting trees, because I think that's the end game. Remember, it's uh, incentivizing the nut processing and then ultimately planting uh, cultivars that are more efficient uh, because they have so much more percentage of nut meat per nut uh, than the wild ones. Just like there's a crab apple and there's a big 
juicy apple that you graft onto the crab apple. I also graft cultivar walnuts onto wild walnuts uh, with great results. Uh, and out of that, uh, we hope to eventually, and it's a multi-generational thing, but to start crossing and improving the genetics and diversifying the genetics of these cultivars through breeding. And uh, that's one of the reasons why I have uh, partnered up with some younger fellows to uh, inspire them because I won't be able to do, I'll be able to do a little bit during my lifetime, but if we can get a, con a continuum of multi-generational um, uh, enthusiasts, then this can carry on in uh, through breeding, generational breeding, we can really improve and diversify and turn these into really viable commercial crops. But it really starts right now, uh, that's a little bit of a long game. Uh, it starts now with uh, just foraging the wild nuts. Um, we, planted, we planted some orchards, the Nutty Buddies did here in Asheville. We planted some orchards on some leased land. We got some long-term 100 year leases and we planted eight acres of orchards and we got them all planted and they were growing. And it's like, okay, well let's start work on processing. So that's when we started to process wild nuts. And I figured, I said, if we can just break even on wild nuts, then uh, when the cultivar nuts come in, we will just hit the ground running and um, should be very successful. I will say that um, we've been doing this for about seven or eight years. We've made lots of mistakes and we've had lots of successes and we've really mapped out what is effective and what's not. So I think that's the biggest benefit that I might have to offer is, you know, um, saving people the trouble of what we did uh, to get to where we are right now. <clears throat> we are in the process uh, and Lindsay, could or somebody pop up that menu again? We're in the process of scaling up um, the uh, our walnut operation because just doing it by hand uh, was not um, being profitable for us. Thank goodness we loved what we did, but after seven years, we really hadn't paid ourselves anything. Now we've accumulated um, equipment and assets and branding and such things like that. But uh, could you put up number seven? The, uh, thank you. Um, it, it, we just, we're just spinning our wheels and that's fine for house scale and homestead scale, but, and community scale too, where it's a community joint effort and everybody's kind of pulling together for their own personal use. But if you want to make money, you got to scale up. And so uh, that's what we're doing this year. Uh, we'll know a whole lot more next year. Uh, this is a silo I built for uh, the Asheville Nuttery and uh, dreamed about having a silo and getting to the point where we're not just lugging nuts around in crates, but we're actually using conveyance and gravity like a traditional mill would. So we've got all these components uh, that we're trying to streamline uh, moving the nuts around because let's face it, walnuts are really bulky and they're heavy and they're a low value compared to their weight commodity crop. So you're, you can't, you can't touch them. If you touch a commodity crop, you're losing money just flat out. And it's also really important to know that if you're doing things, understand that they're sort of batch processing and there is a uh, throughput like a continuous feed throughput i think up to the community scale uh and home homesteading it's okay to do the batch the batch processing so that video that uh, future generations did was showing an example of batch processing where um and you can you can go back to me so people can see me and, um, or give me, yeah, that's fine. And uh, where I was putting a batch of nuts into uh, that um, dehuller, and then they come out into a crate and then we move them into a cement mixer and that was all well and good, but you can't make money at that. It has to be continuous feed. And that's what I've been working real hard is developing some equipment that, you know, taking, like you saw that 
conveyor that's uh, taking you know traditional agricultural equipment and trying to convert it into um, something that can be used for nuts. I also want to say it's it's um, that if you have any questions, that's one way for me to interact and know that people are out there, which is always great. I went to Lowe's today and there was nobody in the checkout counters and I bought some batteries and I put my credit card in and there was nobody there. And it, it was one of the strangest surreal things I've done in a long time. And it feels, that feels a little bit like doing this where I can't see anybody. <laughs> so it's nice to say, say hi or something like that, or any questions, I'd really be great to know that there's somebody out there and um, love to know what you're interested in. So I'm mean, I could talk about nuts all night long, but if I know what you're interested in, uh, that is great. <clears throat> All right. One thing that I'll go ahead and throw out there, um, Bill, is that I, I'm gonna I'm gonna put this up on the screen too. Is uh, I would like you to at least mention nut oils, since you got a great picture for it. Uh, sure. Yeah, put up the products, and also after that, let's do the flow chart if you got the black walnut flow chart picture after that so let's look at the products great so here's some things that we're, we're making in the nuttery uh, we got the black walnut meats we got the black walnut oil and i'll talk about that in the flow chart i, I want to give an honorable mention to hickory oil because uh, the future generations is excited about a uh, riparian restoration and bringing value to the riparian zone. Bitternut hickory is a high value nut, uh, maybe the highest, uh, second highest value nut. Um, and very easy to process into oils and it's a riparian tree. So I'd like to give an honorary mention to that for rip riparian restoration and utilization and, and creating value out of that area. Um, I use hickory oil a lot more, and it's also about half as expensive as the black walnut oil, I and mean, much more di diverse for its use goes. Uh, in the background is acorn. That's a product value added product I'm doing with acorn flour, but that's not really relevant to this talk. Do you have the uh, Joy? Do you have the black walnut flow chart? Did you get that picture? It was another one of my. Um, uh, not that one. It's a it's a picture of a flow chart with that's it. Okay, great. So let's talk about how walnuts move uh, through our system. <clears throat> yeah. So um, had a question about how to uh, requirements for handling a black walnut from tree ground to processing. First steps timeline for saving nuts. Um, it's all about adding value to the nuts. So I, I use that term pretty loosely. Uh, um, the as soon as you've identified a tree with nuts coming down, that's easy to get to, you've added value to those nuts. You've got it in your mind. It's part of your focus. Uh, it's in your attention. You've added value. The next thing is to go and gather. The best time to gather is where we are is right now because it's just after the main drop they'll drop for a, a, it's like a bell curve they'll drop um uh slowly and then there'll be a big drop and then it'll sort of taper off and um that's a great time to get them i like to get them while the holes are still fairly intact they're bigger and easier to handle especially if there's some grass involved because when the hole comes off you're dealing with a much smaller nut albeit you're dealing with one that isn't as bulky and messy but it's also it's harder to get out of the grass especially if you're using a roller um uh, a nut roller you've got the great thing about black walnuts is you got lots of time it's the last thing the nuts uh, last nut that the animals fool with and it's really specific to squirrels like deer don't eat them bear don't eat them raccoons don't eat them only squirrels and squirrels are after hickories and acorns uh first and then they kind of like piddle around all winter on the walnuts uh, after all the other nuts are gone <clears throat> so you got a nice window of time where the other nuts it's a it's a crazy race um because everybody wants those hickories and walnuts or sorry, hickories and acorns. 
Um, so I usually get my hickories and acorns first, and then just like the squirrels, I get the walnuts. Um, and so when you get your walnut in, uh, and the first thing that needs to be done is you, you got an in-hole walnut, see at the top of the black walnut flow chart. We're gonna have to take the hull off. And um, there's a, we have a machine, uh, we, you saw a batch machine where it was like the cheese grater on that um, video. But what we have now is we have a, it's basically, essentially an, a hammer mill. It's a chamber with a, a shaft that turns with chains on it and it basically whips the holes off and they fall through a grate. Uh, we got this uh, design from a patent from like 1954. You can go to the patent office. It's a great place to look for inventions. <clears throat> and, uh, and basically what it is is the nuts can just go through this thing and, and the chains are on a spiral and they just kind of beat the walnuts uh, through the, the machine and come out a spout at the end. So that is, we just got that this year. We had that built and it's working pretty good. Uh, you have to be careful. We put too big a chain on it. I think we put a quarter inch chain on there and we ended up uh, taking that down to, we put a half inch chain or three eighths, I forget. And now we've got a quarter inch chain on there and that doesn't crack your nuts. You don't want your nuts to crack in the dehulling uh, process. So once those are dehulled, you want to store and cure the nuts. The hulls are put aside if you have a use for them. Otherwise, they make great compost and great fertilizer. Don't be thwarted by the myths of how toxic juglins are. It's really not true as they break down very rapidly in a compost pile. Um, so those hulls, can be used, you'll see to the left, the, the arrow of dehulling uh, compost, of course. Medicine is, uh, it's a de holes are traditionally used as a dewormer. They're actually used on a larger scale now for organic feeds, uh, for animal feeds. Uh, you won't sell much as medicine for human consumption, but I think the big, the big, big market is the organic feeds, but you'll have to be a pretty big player to supply those big um, mills that are making organic feeds. Dye is a small marginal market. I uh, wouldn't get too excited about that. Um, but, you know, we have somebody who's interested in, and they're buying 500 pounds, I think, of holes of, from us, uh, maybe not that much, uh, to, to try and see how it goes. <laughs> what I'm really excited about with holes, I haven't had, we haven't had the time to, to set that up as maggots. So I don't know if you fool with black walnuts, but they are covered quite often in, um, I'm reading, I'm reading the little thing here. Uh, I'm trying to talk and read those things. Uh, maggots are very uh, plentiful and uh, like the acorn maggots, their, their job is to eat and then fall off on the ground and bury down. So if you have bringing walnuts in and your truck, you move the, remove the walnuts from your bed of your truck and there's just loads of maggots there and chickens love them. So it's great chicken food. I would love to set up a, 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 a rack, a drying rack with trays underneath where the maggots fell down uh, and the holes dried rapidly so they don't mold and they're a high quality for medicine possibly. And then take those maggots and feed them to chickens. Uh, I think it's a great, there's just tons of them. So that's a little bit about the hull. I wouldn't, you know, that's later on when you're really moving a lot of material. After your nuts have been dried, you know, cured for, depending on the context, if they're inside and or it's fairly dry, they should be dry in a couple of weeks to a month. And then you can start cracking them out. And uh, this is the, this is the part that really gets people and has pretty much shut down most people's business attempts at a business for black walnuts because sorting hand sorting is what you're up against and like i said if you're touching a commodity crop you're going to be losing it's going to be really difficult to make money so this is something that we are working on for automating uh with optical sorters i think and then that's what hammonds does they have, have at least 10 huge commercial uh sorters 
uh, I would like to see uh, uh, a sorter developed that uses AI. So artificial intelligence is is a, has, holds a lot of promise for being effective for differentiating between shell and nut for the for for uh, making the meat. Now in the cracking process, uh, you get quite a bit of fines. So that's little bits and pieces. They're too small to um, to really sell as meat. And those will be used for oil. Lesser so, uh, milk and walnut cream is a really fine and nutritious product, but it's very strong flavored and it'll be tougher to find uh, the people that have the taste for that. Um, oil, oil is a great thing to do with your leftovers in the cracking process. Nut butter is nothing really to get too excited about. Nut, we produce a little bit of nut butter when the oil sits in a bucket and the solids settle. There's basically nut butter on the bottom and it would be so expensive really to sell that we just end up using it for ourselves. Uh, and believe it or not, that the um, Hammonds, the big guys, uh, is reputed to make most of their money on black walnuts, not on the meat, but actually on the shell. Remember, black walnuts are 90% shell and 10% meat. So that's a lot of material. If you're throwing that out, you're throwing out a lot of potential. Traditionally, shell has been used as sandblasting abrasives. There's a big market for that and, and all sorts of abrasives. Now there's a lot of abrasives where people are looking for eco-friendly abrasives, everything from skincare to fracking to jet engine cleaning uh, to sandblasting big potential market for that. I think you have to have a pretty big scale to be able to uh, sell to some of those outfits. Uh, we've done some experiments with biochar and it is a first rate biochar. It's very um, resistant to breakdown. It also has interestingly enough, I think eight point plus uh, pH. So it's incredibly alkaline. So if you want to alkaline a system, uh, the walnut biochar is really great, so, but great for filtration where erosion is, you know, resistance to erosion is really uh, something that's important for a filtration system. On a smaller scale, we're, we're going to try and uh, package up some kitty litter this year. And what enable that is uh, the resuscitation of an old hammer mill. So there's all these old hammer mills in these farms. Uh, and uh, it's a perfect tool for busting up nuts into smaller pieces. And kitty litter is a market where you don't need to have a whole lot of volume. You can do, uh, you'd be selling the, to, to your local pet stores. And, and uh, here I know in Asheville, people are pretty excited about eco-friendly products like that. And I think that's it for the flow charts. You can get me back and... Ooh, I want to look at these questions, but I don't want to have a big pause either. So I don't know how really to do that. I'll oh, help you out with that, Bill. Great, appreciate any help you can give me. <laughs> yep. So we have a question. Um, is there any value in the other parts of the nut? What other parts? I just, I thought I just covered all that. Is there some part I missed? We'll give them an opportunity to respond back and we'll move on to the next question. Um, um, I'm looking at the one, have you, I thought I did pretty good here. Uh, have you heard of the husk, uh, leaving the husk on too long? Yes, I've heard about that. Um, and it's, it's a little bit of a concern and not so much. It might be more of a concern when we get into the cultivars with thin shells. The thick shells are pretty protective of this tannins seeping into the shell. Um, yeah, I wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't put too much emphasis on that either, whoever asked that question. Thank you for that question. Bill, um, so we have another question here in the Q&A regarding planting. How far apart should you plant walnuts? Can we save that for when we get into the orchard planting, which is probably coming up pretty soon? Just Absolutely. let me make sure. Let me let me make sure I'm covering what I want to cover. 
Um, we have another comment that they are specifically interested in dealing with the pectin. Could you speak to that? I don't know about the pectin. Would they like to share a little bit about pectin? I'm not familiar where pectin is in black walnuts. So it's, we believe it's pectin. We don't know for sure, but it's in the syrup. Um, so if you haven't made the syrup bill, then this would be out of your wheelhouse. Oh, you're talking about syrup. It's syrup with black walnuts. It is out of my wheelhouse. Uh, that is something to be also said. Um, I know there's been a lot of emphasis on black walnut syrup. Um, you can, you've got redundant crops from a single tree, which is pretty fabulous. So you've got this, you've got the, um, the golden goose, which is your walnut tree, which would be ultimately the timber. Um, but the goose laying eggs is the syrup and the black walnuts. So you've got this continual cropping, multiple cropping from the same tree, you know, once in the spring and once in the fall, which is handy dandy. And, uh, and then ultimately, if you need to cash out with a golden goose, you can, you can cut that tree down for timber or thin them out. I don't think that um, growing timber trees and growing trees that will be productive for nuts uh, will work together very well. When you start crowding trees, you reduce the canopy and sunlight, and sunlight is what initiates uh, floral buds, which ultimately make nuts. So um, you can do that, uh, but ultimately, I think you want to probably do one or the other well instead of doing both kind of halfway. <clears throat> Uh, is it necessary to clean the nuts prior to curing? Yes. So that's the dehulling process. And also uh, the cleaner you can get those nuts, the less debris and stuff that mixes in with your nuts. Uh, what happens is, is when you crack them and you've got those fines for oil, uh, the bits and pieces of dry hull that's still on the nut will mix with that and it will... Uh, will flavor your oil a little bit because it all gets pressed together. So definitely uh, good to clean your nuts as much as possible. We use a, we've used a cement mixer traditionally and actually today I've finished uh, 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 something that I've been tinkering with. And that is uh, basically the cement mixer is the motor, but it's a, it's a trammel or it's a, it's a, there's flights uh, on the side of a, a long barrel that pick the nuts up out of a float tank and then deposit them into uh, the next stage. And it's important, which reminds me, it's really important to float your nuts, especially in the beginning of the season, because a lot of the early nuts are duds and they are a nuisance. And you can get them out really easy by floating your nuts. Now, if your nuts have been out in the sun and dried up, they all the good nuts, many of the good nuts will float too. You really want to float, you want to dehull and float your nuts as soon as possible, skim off all those bad ones or the duds, and you'll have a high, high percentage of quality nuts. <clears throat> Lindsay, could you give me the menu and see what else we have on tap here? Make sure I didn't miss anything. Yeah, sure. Um, Joey, go ahead and pull that up for him. Um, and while Joey's pulling up that, um, we will, have, we have two other questions here. Um, one is a two-part question. What are the primary differences between batch production and continuous? What scale would you need to make continuous production a worthwhile investment? What was the first part of that question? The difference between what, the two? Yeah, what are the primary differences between batch production and continuous? Right, so batch is just, you doing it, you, it's a less sophisticated and easier to set up system because you're just setting up one machine that does this and there's more manual labor moving the nuts from one, one machine to the next. So you do a batch and then you, it comes out and then you pour it into another machine and do a batch of that. Ideally, you just put nuts in one end and you have what you want on the other end. You put your, and so, um, that's continuous feed. When some when when the nuts flow through a machine without you having to mess with them to the next machine, that's the ideal. What's the scale to do that on? 
boy, oh boy, it depends on how much uh, you can tinker yourself and how much you have to, you know, have other people make stuff for you. And that gets expensive. We do a lot of our own in-house tinkering. So, you know, theoretically, we can do it on a small scale. I will say, just for rough numbers from my experiences, we've been doing about 8,000 pounds of nuts a year. And we've been doing it by batch. Uh, and that's not, you know, a whole nut is twice the weight of a unhold or sorry excuse me and a uh, whole nut <laughs> I don't know. a nut that is in its hole weighs twice as much as when you just have the nut without the hole okay so when i say eight thousand pounds i mean eight thousand hold nuts eight thousand pounds of hold nuts um that was we were not making money at that. And that was, and we were working way too hard and moving way too many nuts. And uh, we were doing that by batch. I think something less than that would be efficient to start initiating continuous feed machines. We're shooting for uh, 20,000 pounds this year. And all that is going to be dependent on <laughs> on this machine, this optical sorter, which we've nicknamed the Messiah, because it's the one that's going to save this whole thing. Really, I don't think you can even talk about doing nuts economically unless you automate your sorting. It's the ultimate pinch point. It's the one that shut everybody down. I wish I could give you specific nuts, that, or nuts, I wish I give you specific numbers to your question about when, when is it efficient to do batch and when is it efficient to throughput. But if you're serious and you want to make money, you got to figure out as much throughput uh, systems as you can, continuous feed systems. If that didn't answer your question, just reframe it for me and I'll try and take it on again. Is there anything else, Lindsay, that's... Yeah, we have two other questions. Um, are there any facilities in West Virginia that will haul black nuts? Yeah, I do. Uh, but I don't have a continuous feed. Uh, I am still doing my batch press uh, with my back of my tractor. And, uh, and then ultimately I bring those nuts to Asheville only because I'm sort of modeling what I see as the first stage of being an aggregate. And I wanna know what that's like. So when I go talking to people about being an aggregate station, I already know experientially what that is. And so that's what I'm kind of doing. And then I'm selling those nuts to the Asheville Nuttery, which is the main where we have most of our equipment. The next succession is you start saving, you start, you know, holding on to these nuts. And, uh, <clears throat> and if you cure them, if you hold them on long enough, you're va adding value uh, to them by drying them, which means you've created storage facilities, uh, cages of some sort to protect them from the squirrels and rodents. And uh, you can sell them readily to a nuttery uh, because they're ready to go. That is the next step. And so, so, so what happens is that you start storing up nuts and holding on to them, adding value. So when the, when the, the, the bigger processor is out of nuts, uh, you say, well, I've got cured nuts ready to go. And they buy them from you. Meanwhile, you're sitting on these nuts and you're thinking to yourself, well, gee whiz, maybe I could start doing something with these and maybe I'll buy or build a piece of equipment and then you start beginning to become your own nut processor. And I see that as sort of the natural succession. And that's what I'd be really excited about trying to inspire people to, to start that journey of becoming a value added processor and really making the most of this incredible resource called black walnuts in their community. Okay, and the last question that we have here, aside from how far apart to plant, is what is the time frame from planting to harvest on a walnut? If someone planted today, what is the time to market? Right, okay. Let's get into it. So I think we're ready to move into, could you give me the menu again, please? Sorry for the pause, everybody. Let's see what we got here. Can you scroll it? Scroll, scroll, is that it? Okay, yeah, let's just go to that tree picture. Perfect. <laughs> this, is, this is a picture of one of my walnut trees. I took this fall. And 
it's two, there's two, two ways you can go about this. You can plant walnuts from seed and you can graft existing trees. So this tree was, um, I didn't have a lot of small walnuts on my place. Now that I'm a walnut uh, aggregate, uh, there's all these walnuts that the squirrels are taking from where I process and they're planting them. So I've got lots of little walnuts coming around my edges in my pear orchard and things like that, which is kind of fun. <laughs> Um, so I have a lot of trees coming up where I can start grafting, but before then I didn't have a lot of small walnuts. So I was grafting larger trees and I was really excited about it. And this tree, you can see a little fork on top. I climbed a 20 foot ladder and then free climbed probably another 10 feet and grafted uh, a cultivar onto this tree because the tree needs to be, can't be any more than four inches in diameter, really where you graft for it to be successful. Preferably it's three or less. So I had to go all the way up there to get to the smaller branches. This, this graft is probably about five or six years old and it may be 40 feet tall and it's pushed out so much growth uh, that it's bending over now it's, and, it's and it's covered in nuts. So it's from the weight of the growth and the nuts in five or six years, is might have been a little bit maybe maybe six or seven but not much more than that uh this thing has become a, a, a pretty good producer of black walnuts and that's pretty outstanding now generally speaking i'm grafting trees that are about an inch or so in diameter above deer brows which would be about five feet and then i put tree guards on it those trees are coming into production again with a precocious cultivar like this one called hay uh in in seven years, six, seven years, they're starting to make nuts of significance. And um, that is really a great return on your efforts. I think it's one of the highest returns I have is to have these cultivar walnuts, which are three, you know, 30% nut meat versus 10% nut meat, so up to 40% nut meat with thin shells. Can you, Lindsay, can you show a close up of that cultivar walnut? This is a this is a cultivar. Check that out, folks. This is a cultivar called Emma K. And look at that shell. And and I still am amazed when I look at them. Uh, and look at that nut meat coming ready to come out almost in a half if you're careful. How I many of you have seen a black walnut half in your life? Not very many times. So that's what I'm talking about grafting these cultivars on. Uh, we also uh, plant cultivar seeds we go out of our way to get cultivar seeds and plant those uh, as our orchard and as as the rootstock essentially and they're planted to answer your question i plant them on 40 foot centers walnut takes up a lot of room uh it's a tree also that doesn't need a deer fence. So I planted 40 acres of nuts about four years ago and I put a deer fence around most of it, the chestnuts and the hickories and, and the fruit for deer. Uh, I didn't have to do that for walnut because deer will hit your walnuts about your second year. So the second year, third year flush in around June, they hit the tops of your walnuts really hard. But I've learned not to plant nuts by seed because in that walnut orchard, that I planted, plant 10 acres of cultivar walnuts on 40 foot centers. I think in a matter of three weeks, a red squirrel, or, or sorry, a fox squirrel had dug up seven acres of that planting. And I planted two nuts in each hole, 40 foot centers. And I knew it was one squirrel because it was systematic row by row. So that's pretty, they're impressive critters, formidable competitors. And I finally trapped it out after I replanted and it ate a bunch more. <laughs> and uh, uh, and then, the, then the nuts started to grow. I don't think I'll ever plant a nut tree by seed ever again. As nice, as, as, as sexy as it sounds and uh, growing on its own taproot without being transplanted sounds great. Uh, but predation by the animals was devastating to me. I don't know how many times I had to replant things because of the crows because of the squirrels, because of the deer, um, maybe not so much the deer, but definitely the, the, the crows and the squirrels and the voles. And um, <clears throat> I now highly recommend that you plant cultivar seeds in nursery rows and irrigate them and baby them and get them grown up to their fullest potential the first year, first year and then get them out 
I wouldn't let a well cared for nursery tree walnut go two years because they're going to be too hard to dig up. And that tree is going to be pretty sturdy. That's another reason why I like black walnuts because is anybody out there um, ever killed a black walnut? No, it's really hard. You chop them down and they just keep growing back. And that's the kind of agricultural crop I really, really like. And you don't need to spray them. They're a native crop. Uh, they're tough and hardy trees. So uh getting those trees up to grafting size you've got to contend with deer browse mostly on the second year and that flush like i said in june so you're going to want this is really tough because walnuts you know walnuts they want to spread out they want to fan out like a big fern those big tropical leaves uh and putting them in tree guards is just brutal it's like you know, cinching a girdle around you, basically. They can't spread their leaves out and they, they get spindly and they don't do well. I do this a lot because that's the only guards I have when I run out of cages, make cages out of old fencing um, where I can get, you know, a pretty good circumference, maybe four foot circumference on a five foot fence. So we'll cover, we'll, we'll protect the deer pretty good. So it's about 12 feet of fencing. And, um, uh, that'll get the, get that nut, up, that tree up pretty good above that browse line. They're not super excited about walnuts, but they do like that flush of growth on the second year. And, and that's really disheartening when you get this nice, lovely looking walnut and then man, they just wail on the top. Um, at least they do for me. And then once you get them above browse line, you know, six, seven feet, now you have to contend with bucks rubbing. And especially with that 40 foot center, they're, the bucks love those trees and opening a single tree where he can be a badass and see every, everybody can see him rubbing those trees and he'll just tear those things apart. So you got to keep guards on. I usually put my guards on the first of September, take them off the first of January and use them for something else. I move them down for rabbits, but rabbits don't really hit walnuts. So I use them. So I'll take those guards off and put them on the trees at the walnut, uh, the, the, the rabbits like, like chestnuts or apples and pears. So that's sort of my flow with, uh, with those tree guards. Meanwhile, I really haven't figured out how to protect trees um, other, you know, other than using those guards and cages. So that'll get you a tree that's up about, um, you know, inch and a half in diameter. What we've been doing is we've been, since we use the cultivar, the only reason why we use cultivar nuts is because we want to trial them. Every seed is a lottery ticket. And the better the genetics, the mother and father, the better chance you're going to win. And walnuts actually, especially I've noticed with hay, and I don't have a lot of experience, but with hay, they've been throwing out some pretty good progeny um, pretty regularly. They throw out pretty good nuts, their, their kids. And um, so what we do is we plant, I'm sorry, I don't have a diagram for this. We uh, have this tree and I leave a nurse branch. So I grow about an inch and a half, maybe six, seven feet high. I leave one branch of the rootstock and I graft cultivar on the rest of the tree. And what this does is I'm hedging my bets. I've got uh, this nurse tree, which will uh, produce whatever that rootstock is. It's an individual that has never existed before. And when it puts out a nut, and if that nut's no good, I cut, I'll cut that branch off immediately. If it's good and has promise, we'll keep it there. And it might be a superstar. And we've contributed new genetics to the cultivar walnut library. Meanwhile, we have proven cultivars on that graft growing out that are going to turn into a, uh, a big, powerfully producing uh, uh, tree, walnut tree, walnuts with, our, with um, cultivar walnuts. So we don't really lose a lot of production by just trialing out um, that one seed. And I wouldn't bother doing that unless you really have good genetics. And I'm, good genetics are gonna come from uh, cultivars that you like that are grown in uh, orchard full of cultivars. So you know there's a really good chance that the father is also a cultivar, which is what we did. I, I uh, highly recommend the Northern Nut Growers Association, NNGA, as a resource for this. These guys have been doing this for 110 years, and I went to their conferences and learned so much. I got mentors 
at, at the conferences, these old guys, and they share, they're incredibly generous with their resources, their, their genetics and their knowledge. And they've helped me uh, so much, learn so much. And on their shoulders, do I stand and present this um, uh, webinar to you. Um, let's see. May consider grafting grafting your cultivars in blocks. If you're doing an orchard, walnut orchard, you keep your cultivars in a block just like you would a commercial apple orchard because they all come down at different times. MK, uh, like this cultivar here, is very early and uh, it's finished dropping even before hay starts to drop. So if you're mixing them all up, uh, you're going to, you know, in your planting, it's going to be pretty inefficient. Uh, harvesting because you're going here and there and there. So, you know, think about planting them in rows or in blocks. Uh, uh, like two, if you have two rows of trees, um, plant those in, you know, them together in clumps, is what I want to say. Um, yeah, so that's that covers anybody got any questions about orcharding? And you can switch to me so folks can see me. And, um, Any questions come up, Lindsay, about that? Um, not currently, but if anyone has any additional questions for Bill, please go ahead and place those in the chat or Q&A box, and we will get to those. Yeah, Lindsay, how long do you, do you want me to go for? Um, we have a couple more minutes, Bill. Um, we typically leave about an hour or so for okay, one of perfect. these episodes. Perfect, well, that's about right. Um, I, I don't have a lot more, it's not, unless it's prompted by a, a question, I don't have a lot more to share. Um, if you got any questions, Lindsay, is there, did we, did we cover the agenda of future generations? Is there anything that I need to fill in? No, uh, you have done a fantastic job, Bill. Thank you so much for being here with us this evening. Okay, because um, your agenda is is to inspire people to plant more trees in riparian zones, right? That is one of them, yes. Mm -hmm. um, looks like we had a question come in that we have been speaking about walnuts this evening. Is there another nut that we should be considering? Well, consider for what? Uh, could they could they um, be more specific about what they're considering? So are we talking about for personal use, for uh, commercially? Um, what are they What are they thinking about? It says for profit. For profit, uh, bitternut hickory. I've planted some bitternut hickories. Now hickories are pretty slow, but bitternut hickory is a faster growing uh, hickory. Uh, I dream of. The hands down most valuable and precious thing that we produce in the nuttery is acorn oil is, I can't tell you how incredible that product is. The acorns are slow and fickle to produce, especially the, the, like the, the black oaks. Now pin oaks are very common in the city and they're often around parking lots. And uh, we do well uh, going especially on a Sunday during nut fall, like I would me and my son went out this Sunday evening because that's the latest, uh, that's the most amount of time where cars hadn't been on the parking lot to smash them. And uh, we were able to gather up with, I, I like to use a leaf blower and a rake, but pin oaks are a great crop for making uh, their high oil nut, acorn nut. Um, and like I said, bitter nuts are great. Shagbarks, shagbark hickories grow real slow. They're, they're the best tasting nut. And that's sort of more of a personal thing. It's like, um, they're just so good to eat, but they're just, I don't, nobody, I don't think anyone's ever had a commercial hickory orchard. Um, but bitter nut hickory might change that. Thanks, Bill. Uh -huh. We have another question here. Um, do you think smaller scale might be profitable if you have a niche market where they are willing to pay more, like in an urban area? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, 
I don't, I sell very little, uh, in, in West Virginia. Uh, all, most of our sales are in an urban, mm -hmm. urban market. And I, ironically, um, <laughs> acorns, like our biggest customers for our acorn mixes are, is Washington, DC. I mean, country people just, you know, it's just really ironic. It's ironic that we get most of our, we forge most of our nuts in the city and we sell most of the product in the city. It's kind of funny. Um, <clears throat> one more question here. Um, this is from one of our maple producers. Um, need 10 inch trees. How long for this growth for syrup? I don't understand that question. Yeah. Um, Paul, could you clarify that a little bit for us, please? And this might be a question for Joey, um, depending on... Is that like, how long does it take a walnut to grow to 10 inches? I'm not sure. Yeah, I think that's right, because you got to have a 10-inch diameter at breast height before you want to tap a tree. And so I'm guessing that's what Paul okay. says. If he's planting an orchard, he wants to know when he's going to get that 10 inches. Oof. Um, it really depends on the context of the tree. I should have mentioned that walnuts love riparian zones. They love that rich, fertile, moist soil. They thrive there and do so much better um, than growing on like a ridge. You just don't see them on ridges doing very well. They grow very slow. But if you got it down in a riparian zone, I would expect, you know, at least a half inch of growth in a really good, nice area. So that's how much is that 10 inch tree with a half inch growth that's an inch a year 10 years 12 years uh, in a really great optimal place back of the envelope you can give me a hard time 12 years from now saying no it took longer or shorter great thank you um <laughs> we have a minute or so left. So if anyone has any additional questions, please go ahead and put those in the chat. And while we are collecting mm -hmm. some last minute questions, um, Joey, can you go ahead and launch the poll for everyone? Yeah, I sure will. We do have one in the Q&A box. Um, so Bill, what are the best places to find uh, species to graft? Um, if you're trying to graft your small trees, where you get them? Uh, I get them from some of my friends that I made in the Northern Nut Growers Association. Unfortunately, there was a co-op, the Nebraska Nut Growers Association, and, and, and they've kind of broken up, but they still might be existing. They had a great selection of cultivar scion wood that they would sell. So any NGA, Nebraska Nut Growers Association, is a good resource. Um, you join the Northern Nut Growers and meet some people, maybe look at the their, their quarterly magazine or whatever, newsletter. There's probably advertisements in there of nurseries. Um, yeah, just there's nurseries out there that sell cyan wood. I, I don't have a big collection. I sell some cyan wood um, of some of my, what I've been told are, are the, the best producers, you know, I, I, I met these guys in Northern Nut Growers. I would, I would come to an old guy and he'd, I'd ask him like, what are your favorite three walnuts? And he would say this, this, and this, and that's what I, I went with that. I just went with their experience. <clears throat> so those three cultivars, I don't like to give out cultivar names cause I want people to, <laughs> I want people to like experiment. And, uh, but the three, the three good ones to start with are, Hey, my favorite uh sparks 129 and um mk are a good starter starter kit uh, but there's a bunch and i would highly recommend that you try different ones because different ones will be different we'll do better in different localities usually do the grafting is a whole other thing these guys might this future generations have talked about doing a grafting some kind of something uh, i don't know how that would work online uh, it's really best to um, do that in person, but maybe we can pull it off online. I don't know. But that's a whole other talk. Well, thanks, Bill. Um, we'll hang tight here for a few last minute questions um, in case anyone has them. And just a few housekeeping notes for future Out of the Woods broadcasts. 
We will not be having our webinar in November due to the Thanksgiving holiday. Um, so we will see you here on the webinar in December. That will be Thursday, December 21st. And if you are going to be in the Pendleton County area on November 12th, you can come and see the Future Generations Appalachian Program at the Industrial Park in Upper Track for the Capital Christmas Tree Tour. And we will also have the Mobile Sugar Shack there with us as well. So I have not seen any other questions coming in. Lots of thank you, Bills. And sincerely, thank you so much for being here with us this evening. This was a wonderful presentation, um, super helpful. And we would love to have you back another time. Um, yeah, still lots of thanks coming in. So um, we'll stay on here another minute or so, but um, uh, this officially concludes our webinar for this evening. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thanks for being interested in nuts. I think it's a great thing. It's great food. It's great exercise. It's great, you know, it really tests your creativity, tinkering. Um, black walnuts is, it's a puzzle. And, uh, and if you like puzzles and challenges, <laughs> black walnuts are the nut for you and you don't mind getting a little dirty. They're super fun. They're super fun. Well, well it's been fun having you here with us this evening. Thank you, Bill. We appreciate it. You're very welcome. Uh, it, was, it was a lot of fun to, to, to share all this stuff with you. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, hopefully, we will see lots of faces um, on November 12th at the Capitol Christmas Tree Tour. And if we miss you there, we'll see you back here in December. <laughs>